Thank you very much all for coming. I'm very, very touched that you want to hear Caroline's story a bit more. So I'm just going to start with um, a bit of the introduction that I've got in my book. And then after we've gone through that, um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to actually read the ballad through. So you'll be able to hear, hear that in its entirety. And then we'll dig down a bit deeper into, into her story after that. So. Something about Caroline Cotrami haunted me for many years after I'd first come across her when looking at 19th century freak shows for an MA in Victorian studies. It's a sad and tragic tale that has kept calling me back. Many have heard of Joseph Merrick, also known as the Elephant Man, but Caroline Cotrami's story is just as significant, emotive and poignant from a female child's perspective of experience of disability and exploitation through exhibition in the 19th century. Kutrami is thought to have had primordial dwarfism and it was her stature that intrigued showmen to market her as the Sicilian fairy. A Dr Gilligan came across her in Ireland and advised on travelling to England for her health. Instead, she was consequently exhibited from Liverpool to Manchester, to London in the year of 1824. And some weeks later, she died in a carriage on her way home from a, a performance. Kutrami's tiny body was then sold to the Royal College of Surgeons for dissection, much to the dismay of her family. She was believed to be nine years of age and only approximately 50 centimetres tall at the time of her death. Her skeleton was preserved and originally stood next to Charles Byrne, the Irish giant, in the Hunteri Museum at Lincoln's Inn. I saw her tiny bones on display there in 2008, which made a lasting impression on me. Caroline Cotrami died in 1824, and this publication has been um, created to commemorate 200 years since her death. Just going to get to the next slide. Thanks. So the academic Emily Fergus describes a viewer's encounter with Caroline, which is written about in the column Sights of London in the Literary Gazette of 1824. So here I've highlighted some key words that express what impression Caroline gave to the viewer at that time. Her effect on the viewer is deeply unsettling. So astonishing is her appearance that he cannot quite believe what he is seeing. She challenges both logical expectations and rational inquiry. Her size so flouts the expected categories of humanity that she cannot be classified as such. She is, somehow, not quite real, a tolerable-sized doll, a creature, perfect in all parts and lineaments, uttering words in a strange, unearthly voice. Here is the fairy of your superstition in actual life, the pygmy of ancient mythology brought down to your own day. So I also came across this extract, don't worry about reading it all, I'll read out some highlights, um, from The Women Who Run With The Wolves by Clarissa Pincola Estes, um, which explains the significance of the figure of the fairy um, as doll-like. So the doll is related to the symbols of leprechaun, elf, pixie, fairy and dwarf. In fairy tales, these represent a deep throb of wisdom within the culture of the psyche. The doll is like the little bird in fairy tales who appears and whispers in the heroine's ear, the one who reveals the hidden enemy and what to do about it all. So due to Caroline's extreme smallness, she was perhaps considered doll-like. It's interesting to note that there were other dwarves um, that were exhibited as fairies at the time, um, like the Corsican fairy, the um, Devonshire fairy, and a mythology was created around this at the time um, to return to a more innocent, simple time, uh, or to the fairies from our, our childhood storybooks. I think that was their, their line of thinking. So imagining of a pre-industrial um, time before cities were expanding at a rapid rate, and the affection for fairies may have been to escape that threat from the modern world. So it could be said to be a projection of the fears of the individual. 
to imagine for a moment that she could be the fairy of your dreams and transport you to a magical place, an idyllic scene, away from the dirt and grime of the city to simpler times. So a form of escapism, much as we have now, when we want virtual reality rather than, than actual reality itself. Okay. And now, without further ado, I'm going to read, read you the ballad. This tale gives fair warning to young and old, for this is a story that is yet to be told of a small young girl brought from afar to become an unsuspecting superstar. A child of many names, but who was she, never really knowing her identity? A father from Palermo went to Dublin to perform at the Theatre Royal, a life transformed. To begin with, Caroline Foghell, later Caroline Crackham, then the fancy Katrami for the programme. Enter the Sicilian fairy. Aged just nine, she was right to be a little wary. A measure not more than 20 inches tall, she had always been extraordinarily small. Her face like a bird and a voice that chirped was to see her freedom usurped. At first with her parents from Dublin went she, a child from the land of the Banshees, where she'd met the Dr Gilligan, who prescribed some travel for this innocent. Yet the cost of this advice would come at a price. The Falkhouse child of remarkable size for medical men to pull and prod, a scientific specimen from the devil or God. Sailed upon the grey Irish sea to Liverpool, for more exhibition upon a stool. Assigned to one Thomas Crackham, this briefly her new performing name. From 10 in the morning until nine at night, Caroline posed and was no longer bright. Showrooms at number 15, Williamson Square. Her prison, she wished she were elsewhere. Gilligan passed himself off as her father, a sure embarrassment for this doctor, for the audience were wise to the sound of an Irish accent, no trace of Sicilian to be found. The Earl of Sefton and his family gazed at poor young Caroline, a little dazed. After this, the Dr Gilligan moved her on to Chester, Manchester and Birmingham. In 1824, to London went she, lodgings in Duke Street and some English tea. A grand meeting was next on the agenda, a miniature girl in all her splendour. Everett Home, the famous surgeon, as her popularity had begun to burgeon, had arranged a meeting with King George and this Sicilian fairy for him to gorge. The majestic stately home of Carlton House, dwarf tiny Caroline as if she were a mouse, perched on the state bed and legally dressed as a small statuette, a queen in chess. At number 22 New Bond Street, the child put on a show for all to meet the nature rama, a dismal platform, caged like a bird, gawped at to perform. A fondness for all that glittered, streets not paved with gold, but undeterred, for when kindness struck, her heart resolved, and the cruelness of the world momentarily dissolved. The Dublin Journal brought sad news. On the 4th of June, 1824, the world did lose the curiosity, Caroline Crotrami, the fairy, did at once expire to everyone's dismay. The day she died, a crowd of 200 did come to see her before life was interrupted. By a tubercular cough of marked proportion, Gilligan did whisk her away by carriage horsemen. The devastated parents took to sea, from Dublin to London to be with their abductee. An overnight stay at the Saracen's Head. Before the next day, they were met with dread. Arriving at New Bond Street, they heard more news. Gilligan skipped Duke Street lodgings to diffuse that the dwarf's body was now a case for science, but there had not been one ounce of willed compliance. Upon combing streets, a distraught father found his daughter's body was sold for a sum of 10 pounds. What had he done? 
Why had he let her go? The best for her health, but now this was not so. Oh, his poor and beloved treasured child, who had too short a time, no longer a smile. On to the Royal College of Surgeons, too late to see her whole. Dissection for two days of everything but her soul. A permit clutched in the father's hand to see his darling progeny for the last time in this land. Should be no more anatomised at once, to lay to rest should be her last performance. Nine years at death, or was this the truth told? The skeleton the size of a 15-month-old. What is her legacy? What is her voice? A skeleton on display that had no choice. So now it's quite dark. <laughs> so we're just going to go on now to um, a bit about why I chose a ballad. Okay. So the format of the poem um, that I wrote was is a loose iambic pentameter. So that's 10, 11 syllables per line um, with an AA, BB rhyme. Um, so it's like a rhyming couplet. Um, not in sort of a traditional sonnet style, but a rhyming, rhyming pair. Um, and I looked at ballads in their traditional application. As they were passed down as an oral tale, I quite liked that idea um, that it might be something that was passed down the generations, a tale that would be told over and over again, uh, maybe distorted along the way, but um, a, a tale passed down nonetheless. Um, it was originally meant to be a song to which people danced. Um, I didn't fancy setting it to music, although that could be the next stage. <laughs> um, so a ballad could mean any sort of poem with or without music, usually a love poem, um, a simple spirited poem in short stanzas with some um, popular story which was graphically told. And it can usually concern the twin themes of love and death. Um, and stories were, were cut down to the bare bones, and I wanted to have a sort of melancholic overtone, uh, which I hope I achieved in, in my version of the ballad. Um, and also the language and imagery about the, um, one of the lines, which is a child from the land of the banshees, refers to, to Irish folklore and um, the wailing voice of, of the female spirit, the banshee, uh, that, that predicts death, so it's almost like a foretelling of, of what's to come. So I've just included this, another dark quote from uh, Margaret Atwood. <clears throat> the past is a great darkness and filled with echoes. Voices may reach us from it, but what they say to us is imbued with the obscurity of the matrix out of which they come. So we can never really know uh, what the real story is, but we try to uncover it as, as best as, as possible. So I first encountered Caroline's skeleton uh, behind a glass cabinet. She was next to two other small people, of which she was the smallest. A death mask and her stockings and shoes and a cast of her arm were close by. I gazed upon this small child and studied her like a map. The experience felt disjointed and impersonal. From here, I wanted to know her story. I imagined what she might have gone through before she'd been scientifically displayed. When I visited the Hunterian Museum, I was looking at the representation of the dwarf in the 19th century. Um, my study centered around the idea that the Georgians and later the Victorians were fascinate, fascinated by anything out of the ordinary and, and other and projected their fears onto them. So I argued that this was to affirm their own place in the world and to hang on to a pre-industrial era, era, as we discussed at the beginning, where stories of fairies, giants, and dwarves were common. So by clinging on to this notion that they existed in fantasy, they were the fairy creature of their dreams. Um, it was perhaps a form of reassurance during the rate of change due to industrialization. Um, during the 19th century, um, London grew enormously to become a, a global city of immense importance. And it was uh, the largest city in the world in terms of population density from uh, around 1825. It was about 1.5 million people at that time. Keep it on this slide. Keep it on this one, yeah. So um, 
yeah, so why, why did I choose, why did I want to tell this story? Well, I wanted to tell a forgotten story um, that had been put to one side, even though she'd been on display for about almost 200 years. Um, she'd sometimes been studied or written about, um, but not so much in a creative way or in a tribute to her memory. In 2004, there had been a, a puppet show at the Edinburgh um, Fringe Festival performed by the Trestle Theatre Company. And that was an adaptation of Timothy Knapman's book, The Smallest Person. So there had been something about her then um, in the form of a puppet show, but not much since. Um, so I started with that essay and then wrote a short article for the Guildhall Library online newsletter. And it was that that got the attention of um, the descendant of Caroline's family. And it kind of, I've been thinking about this story for so many years since I first saw her. And then it kind of reignited my interest to actually finish it or <laughs> get on with it and do the, do the poem and, and actually complete something about her. So Cal King, who, I, who is here tonight? Oh, great. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll probably introduce you properly later. But um, yeah, so you contacted me and um, it did it did spur me into action um, so I I saw some of the um, stuff that you'd been researching at the Royal College of Surgeons where Caroline had been dissected I didn't much fancy looking at those records myself and I didn't feel there was a need to look at them to sort of tell her story from the time she was alive um, but I really wanted to do an animation um, at the time and this was I was stuck on this idea for ages just wanted to do <laughs> I wanted to do an animation. I, I, it was so expensive and very, very time consuming. I still have a dream to do that. Um, but I did, I contacted the Peter Anderson studio because I had a connection there. And then I went to Brunel University who um, they have a great uh, students there that are really amazing at doing animation, but it was still going to cost some money. So I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll just do a book instead. We'll just, we'll start with that. <laughs> and then we can do the bigger dreams and maybe contact Guillermo del Toro at a later date, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> That's the dream. Um, so my research largely came from um, ephemera and newspaper cuttings, the Royal College of Surgeons, uh, Wellcome Library, British Library, and the, uh, the wonderful LMA London Picture Archive. So a bit about Caroline's journey. Caroline's family travelled from Palermo in 1815. So I decided to begin the story from when she travelled to London from uh, Dublin with uh, Dr Michael Gilligan, <coughs> uh, as this is when, when she was exhibited. And that's the focus, obviously, of the, the story. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, prior to that, it had been difficult to find out anything concrete about her early life. So much of the information that I relied upon were uh, newspaper reports of the day. I looked for playbills, but obviously they're ephemeral items and they don't often survive well. Um, although we do have other examples of, of playbills um, of similar dwarfs and fairies and giants in the collection, which I have on display next door. And the people in the room will be able to, um, to, be able to see them after we've done the talk. So this um, painting, which is not in our collection, but it's um, at the Yale Centre of British Art, Paul Mellon Centre, is probably the only painting that survives of, of a depiction of her being exhibited. So at the top it says the Sicilian fairy, and I, want, I thought that said only 2 p to 6 p.m., but I think it's actually 2 and 6. I'm not really sure what it says. It's not very clear. But, um, but yeah, this is... I don't know where she's being exhibited, but this interpretation in that period, in the early 1820s, um, is, is the only one, I think, that, that exists. So it's quite a rare, a rare thing, but good to see what the kind of thing, she, what she would have been travelling about in this travelling caravan. I think this is outside of London, possibly. Um, but yeah, quite interesting. I probably will look into that a bit more, research that a bit further if I can, for my own interests. So I've tried to be as accurate in my representation of Caroline as possible, but some things, as we said, are lost to history. 
Um, so Caroline's age was disputed and she's thought to have been around the age of nine at her death, although we don't know her exact date or place of birth. Her age was perhaps inflated for effect, it's what the showman would have done um, to make her size even more remarkable. Um, there are also various spellings of um, the father's surname, so it's Foghel, Fogel, and which was anglicised, might have been from Dutch or Jewish, German origin, Vogel. Maybe Cal can say something about that a bit later, the question and answer. Um, but yeah, so we don't really, um, don't really know. I don't think Katrami was her real name. It was probably just a, a name for, for show, for performance. And uh, 22 New Bond Street. So in a first edition I did this book, I put 23, but Actually, I've later discovered that it, it was most likely um, 22, um, which was uh, the buildings did run 22 to 23, but yeah, it, it was it was 22 as as seen in this rare uh, newspaper newspaper cutting. And she was sold for the sum of 10 pounds, so that would have been in today's money, with the inflation calculator, maybe even more now, but um, is about 800 pounds. But it's still for for someone's life. That's not very much, is it? Okay. So this is a John Tallis line drawing of streets. This is a bit later in 1838, but you can see, um, yeah, number 22 there where she was exhibited at the Naturama. Um, it's now a, a Burberry store. Um, I think they're redeveloping it and to have a luxury um, hotel alongside it as well. So, yeah, it's very, very different to... Um, to what it was like, and what it was like then. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, again, I'm going to just read this. <clears throat> so this um, is a newspaper report from 1824, and this is what captured my imagination. Uh, it's dated a couple of weeks after her death. So when Mr. Fogg held Kratami and Mr. Andoya, the, the former the father of the above little personage and the latter the proprietor of the Nature Armour in Bond Street, applied to Mr. Rowe the magistrate at Marlborough Street office on Monday last, it was for a warrant to apprehend Gilliger, the person to whom the unfortunate little creature had been entrusted, by which means it was supposed the destiny of the child would become at all that they left behind was the little state bed of the child and its habit, which he, Mr. Donlan, had manufactured for it to be presented to the king. Mr. Katrami, in a state bordering on insanity, based into Surgeon's Hall, where he arrived almost breathless, thinking he might prevent his child from being anatomised. But alas, it was too late. He was shown into a room wherein the first thing that caught his view was the body of the dwarf mangled in a most dreadful manner. Mr. Katrami left London immediately by the Liverpool coach for Ireland to communicate the intelligence to his wife. It appears that when the child was taken from Ireland about six months ago by Gilliger, an agreement was regularly drawn up and attested by witnesses and stamped between Katrami and Gilliger, in which the latter agreed to allow the former £60 a year out of the profits arising from the child's being exhibited. Gilliger has not since been heard of. It is supposed that he netted about £1,500 by the child's exhibition and that he has gone to France. So I just, yeah, I was really moved by that because it shows she was just completely exploited and not treated as a human being. And, and the fact he's frantically trying to, to find his daughter's body um, and I imagined both parents coming to London after hearing the news, but in reality it was just, just the father, I think, from, from what that newspaper report said. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, just really still <laughs> moves me somewhat. Yeah, so this one. Um, so Cal shared his research with me from the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, this was one of the documents that he found. And a copy, a facsimile copy, has been supplied by the Royal College of Surgeons, which I've popped at the front. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, you can have a look at it uh, afterwards. Um, and yes, so it says, I'll just get the caption. 
So on June the 7th, 1824, Sir Everett Home brought in a box the body of Miss or Mademoiselle Kashami, the Sicilian dwarf, who died on Friday last, June the 4th. 22 and a half inches high, weighing, by guess, between five and six pounds, aged near nine years, born at Palermo, said to be born the day after battle, the Battle of Waterloo, consequently the 19th of June, 1815, making her, if true, it says in brackets, nine years wanting 15 days. So, yeah, that, again, that still really, really gets me, the fact that this is just a description of her body. It's just, yeah, dis disjointed and impersonal. So now on to something a bit lighter. <laughs> um, so Bronya's silhouettes. I felt that uh, silhouettes spoke of another era and had all, I had always a love of these. So when I, I saw Bronya's work, I, I thought this was the perfect, the perfect marriage for the book. Um, it took some time to realise what we, what we wanted, but I was keen to, for Caroline to still be slightly mysterious as we don't really know exactly what she looked like. Um, a silhouette too is almost like a, a, a ghost as she was a shadow of herself and it has an element of, of the gothic about it. And it fixes her in a, in a particular time. And I hope that also remains somewhat, somewhat timeless. So unfortunately, um, Bronya, the artist, can't be with us tonight. But she has given me a statement um, from her involvement with the book. So I'm just going to read, read what, she, what she said. It was really lovely to be asked by Charlotte to create a number of images for her ballad about Caroline Cotrami. I had not heard of Caroline's story before and instantly felt sympathy for the young, vulnerable girl who had been taken advantage of in such a way. To me, and I'm sure to most others, this was a story about the greed of man and how greed destroys humanity. I read through Charlotte's words and when parts of the story conjured an idea in my mind, I drew a picture to fit with that part of the story. The first was the drawing of Caroline's crossing of the ocean, which seems quite significant. She was taken so far away from her family, never to return. The second was more an artistic representation to her size and bird-like features, and a harp to remind us that she may have grown up in Ireland if she had not been exploited because of the way she looked. The third is a representation of people who pay to look at her, how humans treat one another as objects. The fourth is her visit with the king. And the fifth, as in life after death, she continued to be displayed. Along with so many, I see the importance and sadness in the story of Caroline, the little girl with many names. So alongside Bronya's original drawings, um, I used some images from the London Picture Archive from, from LMA to help give, give context for the period and um, transport you to, to do that time. So following the talk, I'm going to play a little slideshow in the background as I'm doing the book signing. So I have lots of images from the London Picture Archive just representing Georgian London, so you can have it even more, um, get into even more of the, the spirit of that time. So I just wanted to show this um, partly because Billy Walters, Walters, which is the um, guy here on the, the left playing the, the fiddle, um, is in our current exhibition, so just to promote that as well. Um, so during the 1820s, there were certainly uh, types for all, all types of entertainment. Um, and he's, yeah, he's got a prosthetic leg there. Um, and he became well known under the title The King of the Beggars. And he was one of the characters depicted in William Thomas McCreef's Tom and Jerry, or Life in London, which we have a lot, um, which this is dated exactly 1824, which is another reason I, I picked it to coincide with, it, with Caroline's story. So I just wanted to talk about the, um, obviously, the attitudes to disability in the 19th century and today. So Caroline's condition was very rare. Um, I mean, to put it into... I don't know how rare it was then, obviously, but now one in um, three million people have, have this condition. Um, so, but it was a cause for fascination for people in the 19th century, which is extended from the 18th century tradition of an interest in 
unusual bodies. Um, she was treated as something to be studied and was exploited, as we've heard. Ashley's disability in this era were not favourable and often mixed with pity and fear of the other. Um, for some, exhibitions were a way of being employed as they would not have had opportunity elsewhere, but in Caroline's case, and I'm sure many others, did not see the profits of these exhibitions. Um, so her story reflects the horrible and brutal things that often happened in the past and shows how a child with a disability was treated. Sadly, although better in many respects, there are, are many instances of poor treatment with regards to disability, lack of accessibility or lack of voice and agency in our modern world. Um, the Walking with Giants Foundation supports the smallest people in the world and there have been advances in medical understanding but social understanding still needs some work. So to round up a little bit, um, I'm just going to display the sources I used in putting this all together, um, some of which are obviously here, um, some books and yeah, it's largely secondary sources to be honest, um, as, as, as well as the um, British Newspaper Library. Um, the best book, and it's a very tiny book, <laughs> is Gabby Woods, The Smallest of All Persons Mentioned in the Records of Littleness. And she was a sort of Guardian journalist, and she just did this amazing story about, about Caroline, and it just covers practically everything. So if you're ever interested in finding out more or just to get an overall picture of her story, um, this, is, this is the one to, to look at. Um, there's one bit in it which I don't know if I should finish it finish with, but I will. So she says, Katrami's fairy-like qualities made her all the more easy to appropriate. She became the pet of each person who passed by the exhibition, and a sign announced that she could be handled by anyone who was willing to pay an extra shilling. I'll leave it there. Thank you. So now I'm going to invite you for any questions and, and obviously Cal is in the room so we might drag him up as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to have a roving mic. <laughs> it's Claire, yeah. Am I audible? Um, what I was, uh, I, I have two questions, but I might, yeah. no, go on, I will ask two questions. The first one you might not, there might not be an answer to, but you said that in the Hunterian Museum she was displayed next to Charles Byrne, the, the Irish giant. What, what is the thing about Ireland? Is, is that, <laughs> stop my phone, I didn't mean, what, is, it, is it that, the, was the, uh, is the Irish link, as you say, an allusion to sort of a pre-modern, is, is that what they were exploiting? By, or, or was it that there were people in Ireland who were deliberately looking for people that could be sent to Britain to exploit in this way? It, it just yeah. seems that it may just be a coincidence that you have these two. Yeah, um, Yeah, I don't think I have an, an honest answer really that's to, to <laughs> that, to be honest. But it's, in, it's a really interesting question that could do with some yeah. further, further study because that, that, yeah, why were they... Why were they and bringing? Yeah, there's, there's something strange there. And then the other thing is kind of linked to it, which is um, I haven't had an opportunity yet to see the Hunterian Museum since it's I been refilled. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask yeah. you. Is yeah. she still present in the current no. iteration? Okay. No, no. I, I contacted them and, and they, they, at the time, to say, will she be back on display? And they're very cagey about it for a long time. But then, of course, then they said, no, she's she's not going to be back on display. Oh. And neither is the Irish giant. I'm very pleased to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. They've only got one picture of um, Polish dwarf. Yeah. Um, Boris Lofsky, I think, his, his, his painting is there, but that's really all. And, and a, an image of Charles Byrne, but nothing about Caroline anymore. Interesting. I, kn I know that there is a campaign by people in Ireland to repatriate Charles yeah, Byrne. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to give him a burial. Uh, absolutely. Um, thank you, Charlotte, and thank you thank for you. thank you for that lovely reading and um, thank you very, very, very much. moving. Thank you. Thank you. Any online questions? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hiya. So Gilligan is described as a doctor. Mm. Was he a doctor? <laughs> I th I think so. Yeah, I think he was part of Royal College of Surgeons. I don't I don't. Do you know much about that, Cal? You do. Do you want to come up? Yeah, Have yeah. we got another mic? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you probably know more about this. I'm a bit rusty. <laughs> um, what, what I do, I do know, know is that, that yeah, he was a member of the Royal College of Surgeons and he didn't go to France afterwards. Oh, did he, he went not? back okay. to Ireland. Right. Um, where I believe he was the um, uh, a doctor at a poorhouse in... I can't remember where it was. I think it was Dublin. Okay. Um, I might be wrong. Yeah. But um, I do have a bit of information on that as well that I can probably dig out. So, so one assumes that his parents would have entrusted the child because he was saying there will be doctors in mm -hmm. Britain Quite possibly, who yeah. will look yeah. after her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the exploitation seems to have taken place mm. immediately. I think there might have been some sort of commercial deal struck. Um, which was... You know, that the newspaper alluded yeah, to, didn't it? Yeah. It's for yeah. her benefit, but yeah. it's also for your benefit, I think, was possibly yeah. the, the deal. Yeah. Um, I, don't I don't know whether they actually saw any of the money that he made. And he, he sold the body, and yes. he had the right to sell I don't, I the body? I, mean, I wouldn't I have thought so. so. He, mm. um, he tried to get a lot more than £10 originally. I think there had been some conversations before she died where he said if she was to die, how much could I get for her? Um, and I think he was hoping for more than 10 quid. Uh, but yeah. yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. The other thing that comes out of that is the horror that the Royal College were happy to mm. pay for. Oh, You. just occurred not anything that was sort of prepped uh, in regard to the dispute or question about her age mm. have you managed to research the medical side of her condition to get a better handle if based on that age and the weight and the size it was realistic that she could actually have reached nine or was modern is modern medicine more of the opinion that she probably was significantly younger well, preschool age or because yeah. obviously we know a lot more now about various conditions than they would have done 200 years ago so in the 1950s um, I can't remember the name of the, the guy that did it but um, a dentician looked at her, her teeth and thought she might have been three yeah. but it was never really it was contested but I, I don't know if you know any more about that no um, uh, there's, there's a couple, couple of, of stories about her though which where they talk about her walking around and talking and, and saying words, and I don't know how much, yeah. you know, she was actually speaking, and so whether that, yeah, it, it's hard to say. In terms of my family connection, there's no record of her being born. Um, so or my it's, it's my times five great grandfather was Lewis Foghell, um, and we've got records of all of his children being born all around the world because he was in the, the British Army we don't have a record of when she was born. Um, so there's, there's nothing nine years or there's nothing four years. I think there's, I think Jan Bonderson possibly yeah, in his book also right. says yeah. Um, yeah. younger than nine, but yeah, it's yeah. hard to say. Yeah, yeah, so it's all, yeah, not set. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment about the um, dentition analysis. Um, I'm a pediatrician, a children's doctor, and um, even with today's fantastic x-ray techniques, which have been proposed to sort of age people using their teeth and using their bones, it's wildly inaccurate. Okay. So it's been used, it was recommended until a few years ago by the government to uh, X-ray unaccompanied asylum seekers to see if they really were under 18 or under 16, and um, that's now been abandoned because it's just not accurate enough. Yeah. Yeah. So I w I wonder whether mm. that three years dentition might actually just reflect her very delayed growth could at that be, particular could be, time. Exactly, that's the Because yeah, it doesn't case. seem to match the other stories about no, her uh, no, her verbal ability exactly and things like that. Her, um, yeah, her voice. Yeah. 
do you think the, the, the nine years is, is really was picked potentially because of the link to Waterloo? So her father yeah. was at Waterloo, and I think there was, and there's. It looks like his wife was with him um, in the kind of the travelling caravan. <coughs> I think it's it's a. It's, I think Everard Hume yeah. tells the story of um, she was bitten by a monkey while pregnant, and that's why. Um, Caroline was born, and yeah, it's, but it's that awful. kind of like maternal impression yeah. thing, which I think was just a good story probably to tell. Yeah, but not true. <laughs> yeah. Hello again. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. <laughs> um, I wondered whether you had seen um, the film The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. No. Um, a Cohen Brothers film. I watched okay. it a couple of nights ago. Yeah. And it's um, a series of short films mm -hmm. all um, set in the Wild West, mm -hmm. to call it that. Um, and there's one short film in it called The Meal Ticket. Mm -hmm. And it's um, th so that uh, little, um, uh, what do you call it, caravan that they, which yeah, had the title, um, mm -hmm. The Sicilian Fairy on it. Um, it likely sort of either folded out. I mean, I'm sure you know yeah. more. But in this, in the meal ticket, um, Liam up. Neeson yeah. is this possibly father okay. taking a a little boy around, yeah. but who is reciting these incredible mm -hmm. um, passages, and it's performance after performance after performance uh, to tiny audiences. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, he no longer is drawing a crowd, and um, something awful happens. Yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, I would I'm recommend you watching again? it. It's called, it's called the, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Buster Scruggs. Uh, yeah, and um, so <laughs> that's one. The title of the first short film, okay. and then the one that I think would interest you is called The Meal Ticket. The Meal Ticket. Okay. Um, which is obviously the the performer. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your amazing questions. And um, now we're going to do a bit of a book signing. I'm going to put the slideshow on for the background.